Okay, we're going to kick things off. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Cormac Cronin Martin. I'm the producer of Move, and um, really great to have you all with us here today for our webinar on autonomous vehicles, the big update. I'm not going to hold things up too long. Um, a lot of uh, you know juicy topics to get into here today, but just before I hand you over to Grayson, I uh, did just want to mention if you enjoyed today's panel, uh, we are going to have another one next week. Uh, it's going to be at midnight British Standard Time because we're going to be bringing together um, the CEO of Lucid Motors, Peter Rawlinson, in Pacific Time with um, Ashwani Gupta, the COO of Nissan on Japanese time. So very late for anyone in Europe, but uh, you'll be able to get that on demand too. So you can see details of how to get that on our website. But um, in the meantime, um, we are looking forward to today's talk. So I'm going to hand you over to your, uh, your host for today, Grayson Brulta. Grayson. Awesome. Thank you, Cormac. Um, hello, I'm Grayson Brulte, and thank you very much for joining the MOVE panel, Autonomous Vehicles, the Big Update. We have a wonderful panel uh, today featuring Chuck Price, Chief Product Officer, Too Simple, Martin Varsarsky, founder and CEO of the GoGo Network, and Jessica Unguccioni, Lead Lawyer, Autom Automated Vehicles Review, Law Commission of England and Wales. Uh, so thank you to our panelists um, for joining us, and thank you at home for taking this time out of your uh, busy day. Uh, to join us. I'd like to ask each panelist to uh, kick us off with the start. Um, what is the current state of autonomy? And uh, Jessica, uh, I'll, I'll start with you. Um, so hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Jessica Guccioni, as uh, Grayson said. Not everybody might be familiar with what the Law Commission uh, is. So I'll just uh, say a couple of words about that and then jump into the state um, of regulation uh, for us. Um, so the Law Commission is an independent body. We were set up by the UK uh, Parliament. Uh, to make sure that the uh, law is up to date. And so we essentially advise government about changes to legislation. And uh, we were fortunate enough to have the Center for Connected and Autonomous Vehicles, a CCAV, come to us um, and ask us to review uh, the law for the UK um, and make recommendations for change. We started in 2018 and we are due to make our recommendations in 2021. Uh, so it's a very apt question, I guess. So what is the state of regulation? I think it's fair to say it's a very open state. Um, and in a way, uh, most people would say, I think, like it like that. Um, we have been advised that it's not a good idea to jump in and make you know, rapid changes to the law, like knee-jerk reactions, um, and instead to make legal change and develop law um, with a view of you know, consulting properly with the public and industry and coming in with changes that are what are, what are actually needed um, in the longer term. Um, I think probably the uh, main achievement from a legislation perspective that we have in the UK is the um, insurance um, reform that was made in 2018, the AV Act, as it's affectionately known, um, which basically provides for um, covering uh, liability of automated vehicles on the road and making sure that anybody that uh, might be damaged by it can have a clear and simple route to redress. Um, so I think that's the main achievement. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that the UK has a very open environment, as I said. Um, you don't need a permit to actually start uh, putting your vehicle on the road uh, with an ADS, but you do have to comply with the law. And there's a lot wrapped up in that, uh, as I'm sure Martin uh, and Chuck know uh, from their experience in deploying in various jurisdictions. Um, so yeah, I think most of the actions at a UN level, but I think we can probably come to that later. And I'll let my uh, colleagues talk a bit more about uh, their experiences. Awesome. Martin, we'll continue with the European UK um, here before we jump to the States. Um, and the question was? Oh, just a quick introduction about, your, about yourself. Oh, okay. okay. That should be easy. So I'm a serial tech entrepreneur. I built uh, three and a half unicorns, let's say, uh, mostly in Europe in the fields of alternative energy or renewable energy, uh, telecoms and healthcare. And you may wonder what do those uh, have in common and why now transportation. But every company I built was based on some new technology that I felt was going to become commonplace, but was uh, generally not yet legislated. And whether it was uh, solar energy or, or wind energy or fiber optics or, uh, or the field of fertility, where I built the largest chain of fertility clinics in the US. Uh, these are highly regulated industries that in, in, the deploy uh, some uh, radically new technology, right? 
and I got interested in AVs in 06, and I started following what Google was doing very closely. Uh, I have built one company in which I lost uh, 50 million of my own money and 150 million of my investors, which was the first cloud computing company in Europe. And since I got badly burned at that one, which was my black eye, I've been watching new technologies very carefully to say when are they ready for prime time, right? And I, I recently raised 43 million as a seed or new round with uh, Axel Springer and SoftBank to start Gogo Network to build uh, networks of autonomous vehicles for transportation of cargo and passengers or cargo or passengers somewhere in Europe. And we're opportunistically looking at all the European countries seeing where we could build our first network and which technology are we going to use. Network's a good way, Chuck, for you to, to share your incredible background and what uh, Two Simple's working on. Uh, well, thanks. Thanks, Grayson. Um, uh, so Two Simple uh, is building uh, autonomous trucks. Uh, we're building the uh, uh, a purpose-built uh, virtual driver for, for this application. Um, we are building a, uh, you know, a, a nationwide network uh, in the US uh, for, for these trucks, uh, and we'll be talking more about that publicly soon. Um, we currently operate across three states, um, uh, Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas. Um, uh, we have, we have uh, 20, uh, carriers and shippers that we uh, work commercially for, uh, moving freight autonomously. Uh, this is the system that's under development. So of course, uh, we have a safety team uh, in place for, for all the autonomous moves, but uh, every, every movement of freight uh, improves the performance of the, of the virtual driver. Um, so we're using, we're using this as an opportunity to train our system on real uh, cargo uh, in real shipping conditions. So we we are we necessarily have to operate uh, day and night and in all weather conditions, and that gives us uh, you know a very powerful basis for uh, developing a uh, commercial ready uh, solution. We're uh, working very closely with the regulators uh, uh, on on making this a, a commercial reality in the U.S. Um, and uh, uh, there are a number of initiatives that, that we're engaged in. We were uh, just invited uh, as the first uh, truck specific player uh, to be part of NHTSA's uh, AV test program, uh, which is a, a new initiative to inform the public on where autonomous vehicles are being tested. Um, and that's a, that's, a, that's a fun new thing that we're, we're, we're gonna be a part of. Uh, and we've been working very closely with the administration on um, uh, making sure that the regulatory uh, climate is right for for this kind of system to 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 be on the roads uh, without a driver uh, soon. And that's a really important point you brought up with the regulatory environment. Before we get to that, I'd like to remind all of our uh, wonderful guests that are listening. Please feel free to submit any comments in the Q and A section. We'll answer them at the uh, end of this panel. And, and jumping back into the regulatory environment as Chuck uh, brilliantly alluded to, Martin, what is your perspective having worked in highly regulated industries, built companies in highly regulated industries? What is your perspective on a, the current state of autonomous vehicle regulation in Europe? Well, I think Europe is greatly behind. It's interesting because on one side, Europe is the largest transportation market in the world in monetary terms. Um, in, in terms of units, it's probably China, but in terms of money, it's Europe, which is slightly more than the US. Um, and yet, Europe is very focused on a present in which Europe leads, which is the, an environment led by combustion engines, by individual drivers, um, by uh, a lot of, private ownership, like, like private ownership of vehicles, not mobility as a service, but mobility as an asset. But the world is going to mobility as a service, it's going to electrification, it's going to autonomous autonomy, 
and Europe is way behind in that, especially considering its size. Um, I think that's partly because the large European companies are so behind. Uh, companies like, like BMW, Peugeot, Fiat Chrysler, uh, the large car makers of the world who are very successful now, uh, but are unprepared for the future that's coming. The future belongs to companies like, like Waymo, Cruise, uh, Zooks, Too Simple, or companies that are, that are building this future, right? And when you say, well, which companies have raised hundreds of millions or billions in Europe to specially purpose and position themselves for the future? And the answer is none. The companies in Europe have raised very little money. So I, I, see, I see that as a sort of like uh, giving up the leadership that Europe now has, because Europe now has leadership in everything, also in the making of trucks or lorries, in the making of, of everything that relates to transportation now, uh, Europe is in, in an incredible position, but it's pretty sad that there is not really a good plan uh, for, the, for the future of transportation. And at GoGo Network, we're working with regulators and people in government, especially the German government and the French government, to try to uh, move them in that direction Jessica spoke about what the UK is doing. And I think the UK has an advantage. And the advantage is that it doesn't have so much to lose. It doesn't have very large car, UK car makers lobbying for nothing to change, right? And, and instead uh, lobbying, which is something that it's done by incumbents, is very strong in continental Europe. And we're trying to balance that and say, no matter how much you wish for this future not to happen, it will happen. In Europe, can you legally drive uh, from country to country in a fully autonomous vehicle today? No, not at all. I mean, it's in continental Europe, it is uh, not, well, none of the trials are happening in, very few trials are happening in continental Europe in very limited circumstances. I mean, when you look at what's been happening in San Francisco, in Mountain View, in Arizona, in Pittsburgh, in so many places, in China too. Uh, very little of that going on in Europe. And, I, and I, as Jessica mentioned, I think the UK is more open for these than the countries of continental Europe. And now because of Brexit, uh, uh, the UK will not be part of Europe, the European Union anymore. And I, and I think actually that may be an advantage if, if they um, if they can provide a friendlier environment. Um, although, of course, driving in the UK has its own issues of driving on the uh, wrong side of the street. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, but I, I, think, I think you can learn a lot from the UK. You can definitely learn a lot from the UK. And Jessica, you have 5AI, which is doing incredible stuff in, in the UK. Are there other companies in the UK that from your perspective are starting to bubble up and how is that regulatory environment to incubate these autonomous vehicle companies in the UK? Yeah, we have a really rich environment. I think also the um, theme of data science and like all the universities that we have and the R&D that's also being uh, sponsored by um, various projects by Innovate UK, like with match funding from industry. So there's been like a real commitment. I think another company that often gets mentioned is Oxbotica. Uh, with uh, Paul Newman, um, who's like very well known and, uh, you know, a great advocate, I guess, for autonomous vehicles and um, their, their deployment. Uh, there's some really interesting companies like Wave that is focusing very much on machine learning, for example, um, also based here. But I think one of the strengths that the UK has is the consortia that it brings together. So you have law firms um, that are developing like a really strong practice in uh, sort of self-driving and supporting insurance as well. I mentioned the um, regulation on insurance being sort of our first uh, foundation, if you will, in the UK for self-driving. And uh, obviously we have such a long history and such a incredibly developed insurance market. Um, and they're like experts in data management and being able to sort of monetize and work with industry. So I think that, that combination of players um, is, is a very uh, sort of uh, important element. And I think as Martin said, we are um, at the Law Commission as well because we're looking to make recommendations for change in the future. We are now working to unpick 
the obligations that derive from a European Union kind of dimension from uh, the you know, requirements that we might have under the United Nations and seeing where there are opportunities to actually be more uh, open for business, um, I think as Martin was saying, because uh, there are some very significant constraints now in terms of the vehicles you are allowed to put on the road. Uh, for example, small series are now limited at 100. It'll go up to 250 in September with the uh, new um, regulation, but come Brexit, that kind of numerical limit will no longer be something that uh, will apply to us. So if there's a vehicle that doesn't necessarily comply with European standards of uh, whole vehicle type approval, we would be able to consider it much more freely. Um, and sort of with our team, we're working on a safety assurance scheme for ADSs, for automated driving systems, and also seeing if we can work with companies and organizations uh, like Martin um, in terms of passenger services and how they might be offered. Uh, trucks are sadly outside our remit at the moment, but we're very conscious that freight and logistics are an incredibly important part. So we're very much looking to understand uh, that market in terms of the intersection and make sure that we do things can act, help enable and be uh, a starting point for also developing that area, which is really exciting. So in a post-Brexit world, do you think the UK kind of goes further and becomes more welcoming to this technology, more companies come online or more investment? outside capital for this technology because the great university system pours into the UK? Oh, is that for me? Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I think um, the UK probably regards itself even now as very open for business in that regard. Like we don't have, as I mentioned, any um, upfront requirement, you know, for um, businesses to even have to tell us their testing, which does have its downsides because it means that then regulators have a bit less of an insight into everything that is happening in their jurisdiction. I mean, that said, um, it's very difficult to do a trial on public roads, say, without um, engaging with emergency services and like being compliant with the law, which is indeed something that needs to happen. So indirectly, we do have uh, safeguards that organically come about uh, just by the application of the law. But I would say it's already a very open environment and it can become possibly even more open. But then I wouldn't want to prejudge what trade agreements might require. So we need to see what ends up happening in terms of those negotiations before we can make an assessment. Yeah, and then here in the United States, we have a, you know, an extremely welcoming environment from, uh, from the U.S. Congress and, and the U.S. Senate with Senator Thune and Congressman Walden leading the way and in Arizona with Governor Ducey, two simples doing all sorts of in, incredible work. And Chuck, I know this is more in, in Robert's wheelhouse, but what are your thoughts on, on the, from the regulatory standpoint from you developing the product in the United States? Um, well, we've had a great working relationship uh, with the federal regulators uh, and also with the states uh, within which we operate. Um, uh, in the U.S., uh, a lot of what happens uh, happens at the state level. Uh, the DOTs uh, at the state level really uh, control what happens in, in their state. Um, uh, but the uh, the federal government is recognizing the need to have a 50 state solution uh, that that allows this to happen and that is an active process that we're participating in um, and it seems to be uh, being well embraced uh, by the states uh, as well so um, we've had nothing but very positive uh, support uh, from from all of the departments of transportation that we've been working with, um, and the the federal regulators seem uh, very forward thinking and very open about um, making this uh, you know something that is a that is a national solution. Um, so so we've been very pleased very pleased with this. Um, uh, there are a couple of holdout states that are that are uh, sort of sort of uh, slow followers, I would say, and we would like them to, to pick it up a bit. Um, uh, surprisingly, uh, California is, is, is sort of far behind the other states. Uh, we'd like to see them pick it up. Um, uh, and since that's where most of the innovation is coming from, it, it's, it just seems ironic. Uh, but they have their own reasons, I suppose. Um, uh, but uh, we've been very happy with our, our experiences in Arizona, uh, New Mexico, and, and uh, Texas. And you're doing a great job. And, and you know, for me living in California, I can tell you it's, it's more of a political issue uh, than, than anything. But um, 
So you're uh, the trucks, the two simple trucks today are operating over state lines and you're going from Arizona to Texas. Is that correct? Correct. We do it uh, multiple times a day. Absolutely. Awesome. And so I'm looking at our questions over here and there's one that, that fits right in. So I wanted to ask you, um, one of our um, questions was, how do you make a truck drive itself? What goes into developing a full level four truck? Uh, well, there's a lot of tech. Um, uh, in fact, if you're interested, if you have pretty much any skill uh, can be applied <laughs> in the development of an autonomous truck. Um, uh, so it is very heavily driven by advances in artificial intelligence and computer vision. Uh, our, our founding uh, thesis was uh, around the application of advanced computer vision and AI techniques uh, to this problem. Um, uh, so, so there's a tremendous amount of work in, uh, in deep, deep neural networks and in, and in other forms of statistical AI uh, that are involved more in our planning uh, arena. Um, uh, you may or may not be surprised that uh, gaming technology, we have a lot of game programmers that uh, get involved in this. And, uh, uh, it is it is a rich application for the same sort of problem solving uh, that happens in game game programming, uh, but there's also a very mechanical and electrical uh, element to this. Uh, as large as trucks are and as powerful as trucks are, the compute technology uh, required to make this work uh, is very power hungry, and so we find. Uh, uh, frequently, and I, I think they find the same with uh, passenger cars, that uh, it's not that we're compute limited, it's that we're power limited uh, in the vehicles. There's only so much power that a vehicle can generate for the computers uh, before it starts robbing the other systems. Uh, so there's a lot of work electrically, uh, you know, in the electronics to make that right, to make that stable. Uh, there's work in optics, there's work in uh, uh, radio, you know, with, with radar sensors and telecommunications. Um, there's a lot of mechanical work that's involved uh, in building specialized racks to hold the sensors. Um, and when you get into the actual problem of mounting sensors on trucks, when you realize that a truck is a giant rolling bowl of jello uh, that wiggles in about eight different directions simultaneously, uh, getting the sensors to work together is a real technical challenge. Um, so there's, there's, there's a bunch of work involved and uh, uh, it all has to happen at the same time uh, to, to make this work. Uh, but once we have the vehicle assembled and the software uh, operating, uh, then is the operational challenge. How do we do this safely? Uh, and we do this through a substantial amount of simulation first uh, so that we know that the software systems, we know how they're going to behave. Uh, then we take the vehicles to uh, test tracks uh, and we do a bunch of work on the tracks to make sure that they're performing as expected from the simulated, the simulated activities. And then finally, uh, uh, once we're confident in that and reviewed all of the results, we'll put the vehicle on the road, uh, but we'll only do that with a safety driver in the left seat and a safety engineer in the right seat. Uh, the safety engineer stays heads down looking at the computer systems, making sure that they're performing properly. The safety driver stays eyes out of the vehicle uh, to make sure that the environment remains safe. Um, and we're very careful. We have a bunch of policies that we apply uh, to, the, to the safety team around when they're allowed to test in public. You know, when things start getting weird uh, uh, on, on the public highways, which they do, uh, we, we direct them to stop testing because, because, you know, the public is not volunteering to be part of our test. They're, they, they happen to be there. So we're very careful when we test in public. Um, so there's a lot of that, <laughs> oh, go ahead. That, that was clearly demonstrated in that 60 minutes piece for the level of safety that you're doing. And, you know, I commend you and the, the entire team at Too Simple for putting the safety of your employees, and more importantly, the safety of citizens that are around your vehicles be first and foremost. So thank you uh, for that. And as, as Martin, as we heard from Chuck, they're developing this technology in the United States. 
And this question comes from a, a very close mutual friend of ours. What type of, is any of this technology for autonomous vehicles being developed in Europe to the extent that it's being developed in America? Well, the, there's, there's efforts in Europe. Jessica mentioned some, uh, and there's definitely, there's Navia, there's, there's uh, Best Mile, there's, there's uh, sorry, Easy Mile, there's, there's the, all the other companies that are working on certain components of these, there's the Daimler Bosch Alliance, there's BMW uh, doing its own efforts. You could divide them into uh, car makers making a Tesla version of an autopilot or trying to uh, beat or compete with autopilot. Um, Elon Musk has made the claim that autopilot will evolve into a fleet of robotaxis um, and that would be amazing, but I find it hard to believe of, uh, how vehicles with only cameras could become uh, absolute robotaxis without safety drivers. And there's skepticism around that claim by Elon Musk, even though he's an amazing entrepreneur and he's had a lot of successes in his life. Um, so I think there are efforts in Europe, but I've done some charts. Um, I cannot share the screen now, but there's, there's a, when you look at the amount of money spent in transportation and the percentage spent on autonomous vehicles, USA versus China versus Europe, uh, you could call the European efforts as a whole quite insignificant. Uh, because it does two simple raised uh, three hundred million dollars uh, to get going, and and Waymo just raised uh, another over a billion, and they probably invested by now five to ten billion. And Cruise, uh, with SoftBank, who invested with us, uh, also has raised in the billions. And Argo, and when you look at the the amount of investment which is not the only measure, by the way, because uh, there are companies like uh, WhatsApp that was built with almost no money and sold for many billions or Instagram or, but in this case, as Chuck was mentioning, you do require a lot of physical things to put on trucks, on cars. You, um, maybe one element I could comment is that there is a fundamental difference in the, the approach of Europeans in general when they think about autonomous driving versus Americans. And in that sense, Europeans may be right, maybe not. I've spoken with John Krafzik about the ease of Waymo, which is that America has sort of the cowboy approach, and I know it's terrible to call American cowboys, but I'll do it anyway, which is the concept that each car should fend for itself, right? that you shouldn't rely on a smart city to tell you, I am a traffic light, I am a divider. Um, and Europeans, when they think of this, they think a lot about uh, society and a, a fleet talking to each other, vehicle to vehicle, all the vehicles signaling to each other, the traffic light saying, I am red, I am green, the city's being smart, helping the cars. Uh, sort of like, no, you, you don't need to be a cowboy. We have a whole city helping you to be autonomous. And that is, I've seen, for example, the head of BMW arguing the case for smart cities. And there's a lot of belief that smart cities will make autonomous vehicles safer. But when you talk to somebody like John Krafzik, he says that's not the case. And when you talk to somebody like Elon Musk, he's like, I don't even need a lighter. So is America an arrogance or is America right? We will see. Well, America's innovating and you open up the whole V to X debate, which nobody has the right answer. And then we saw the, the head of AI research for Tesla came out with that paper um, earlier this week about camera based and it, we're, we get to see. And Chuck, do the two simple trucks require any infrastructure? Are they operating completely autonom autonomously without infrastructure? Oh, yeah. And and uh, and I can, I can actually address a couple of couple of points that that uh, Martin made uh, as well. But um, uh, we do not require uh, a B to X uh, type infrastructure, and uh, we are of the view that while B to X uh, can enhance uh, our perception of the world, uh, it can't. Uh, we can't rely on it to define 
our perception of the world um, because V to X systems fail like every system uh, does. And we can't, uh, we can't be promised that uh, the system will work on a particular li traffic light system. You know, it may be down. So we still have to interpret the lights just like the humans do. Uh, we also can't uh, assume that every pedestrian will wear, you know, their, uh, their device that reports their presence uh, on, on the road um, uh, or that every car has its, its V2V system operational. Um, so our systems have to see the, the world as it is. Uh, and V to X systems will enhance that view, but it it won't um, it, it won't be the the replacement for uh, for for you know onboard perception systems. Um, regarding cameras, I think it's an interesting uh, uh, comment uh, you made, Martin. Um, our system is primarily camera based, um, so our long range per perception is a camera. Uh, solution our our system can can interpret a scene out to a thousand meters uh, completely interpret it out to a thousand meters understanding uh, the the classification of objects their trajectory their three dimensional pose um, uh, and we can predict where they're going next out to a thousand meters and that's all thanks camera for using meters by the way <laughs> yeah uh, we're engineers. Um, and uh, 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 for, for those for those who aren't uh, uh, in Europe, uh, that's over a half mile. Uh, um, we do use lidar uh, as the as the vehicles uh, as the objects get closer to us uh, as as a secondary sensor and as an enhancing uh, sensor. Um, uh, it it increases our confidence and our precision. Uh, but we don't depend on LIDAR. Uh, we can have LIDAR failure and, con and, and continue. Um, uh, it, just, it just increases our accuracy. So I, I, you know, I, I think uh, Elon makes bold statements uh, always on everything. Um, uh, but in the case of cameras, we actually tend to agree that it is possible with camera and radar uh, to, to make this work. But you have to be very, very good with cameras uh, to do that. It is not something you get off the shelf. And Jessica, as the commercial vehicle operators scale, scale globally with different solutions, who needs to come to the table to ensure a balanced regulatory framework that's scalable globally? Well, I think um, you have like very sophisticated players, like you know some of them uh, obviously co-panelists with me today. Um, I think one of the things that uh, we think is very important needs to happen is to make sure that you have um, groups of, for example, safety groups and uh, vulnerable road user representatives um, uh, participating and you know doing this idea of co-design. Um, we consulted on this in our latest consultation in developing uh, regulation for passenger services that might be autonomous and you know, politicians, and I guess a lot of also the companies that are promoting this technology, they often highlight the possibilities that this holds for those that are currently unable to drive um, or unwilling to drive, for example. And, um, but if you look at the reality of deployments, um, a lot of the vehicles that are currently being used or the design um, of some of the passenger services isn't actually necessarily compatible with the needs of um, a lot of uh, disabled persons and disability comes in, you know, every shape and size not just a wheelchair and that's something that often gets uh, misplaced so um, you know there are many things I could say about who needs to come together and of course you need to bring regulators and industry together um, I think disability groups is one and I think the other element um, that I think is really important and sometimes can get missed um, is something that I've observed uh, just within the United Nations framework which is doing fantastic work you know on the technical regulations in working party 29 for example um, working on that element and then you've got working party one which is looking at the uh, various conventions and obligations of road traffic and those two uh, parties need to work together and they're making steps to work together better but you tend to have all the lawyers and the policy people grouped in working party one and they look at road traffic regulation and how should that evolve and you've got most of the engineers and more technically minded people really dominating working party 29 
And the problem is that these two tracks can actually sometimes not necessarily talk to each other in a system like an ADS, which absolutely needs to take into account the human factor and has such huge repercussions in terms of policy uh, implications for society. Um, and so if you don't get lawyers and engineers to actually communicate, and sometimes you think you're communicating, but you might be using the same word, and to an engineer, they might not even think, you know, for a lawyer, you know, what does reasonableness mean? Or um, what, what is a detectable collision, um, for example? And for an engineer, they might have a very specific idea of what that means. But then if you ask a lawyer, what are you expected to detect, say, as a collision? That might be an entirely different question. Um, and I think there is a bit of an issue in bringing those two very important elements together in a way that's functional and doesn't just lead to stalling and not understanding each other. So I think there's more that can be done there to bring us together. And you bring up a great point with, with the human factor is probably for passenger side of the house, that's the most important factor because they're going to be the end consumer. And in a post COVID-19 world, how is, how is this going to change? It's really interesting. It's so hard to make any predictions about the future. Um, you know, even at the beginning of this year, I think none of us would have expected to, you know, be doing so many uh, Zoom calls, for example, and uh, webinars. Uh, but I think um, certainly in the ACEs, which had been a mantra for, you know, the development of self-driving cars as well, you know, like all these developments coming together, the shared element has suddenly come into relief and is no longer uh, such an assumption that people might be willing to share as much or all the time. Um, so I think uh, what COVID has really brought into relief for us is um, this whole question, which has always been important, but is even more important now, which is not to make assumptions about business models and ways in which people get around um, and the ability to be resilient and actually flex and change um, in terms of what the needs might be. So helping get key workers out and maybe, you know, spike in needs for deliveries and logistics, suddenly taking a much, you know, bigger burden, um, you know, than they might have done before. Um, and being able to adapt um, in that way, rather than thinking in terms of, you know, as things have always been, so they must continue. But I also am hopeful that, um, you know, we might come back to a world where we are able to you know, not have to social distance from each other and people will be, you know, out and about again in social groups and events. And so a lot of the learning and the things that we aspire to will still apply. So absolutely shared mobility, I think still has a really important role. And frankly, there's not, you know, another way of getting in densely populated cities. Um, you need to find a way to make that work. Uh, you can manage the demand, which is what has happened now. You know, you've killed demand for transport in many ways. Um, you can improve that. But I think we still need to think of um, good ways for sharing um, transport. And I think that's a really important uh, part of making the deployment of self-driving positive for cities. Well, that's um, a good point. Martin, what are your thoughts on a uh, shared mobility yeah, post COVID? -19? I was going to comment on that because I, I, I happen to have been involved with COVID or been involved with COVID as a request of the, I mean, even though Google is a German company, I'm uh, based in Spain and the government of Spain uh, drafted me to lead or co-lead the development of an app uh, to diagnose uh, COVID by digital means and I was quite involved with the, with the making of this app and, and because I've also worked in healthcare and I originally studied biology and immunology I was uh, here's these two worlds that were so different to me my last company the fertility uh, clinics and this transportation. All of a sudden, healthcare and transportation were merging, and I was asked to work on how do you make a transportation safe in a COVID world. And and people were asking me those questions, and I had to bring sort of uh, knowledge from both fields and certainly consult with a lot of people who know much more than I do about each field. But I I think that um, I hope what Jessica said is true that that. COVID passes like other pandemics have passed. Um, there is now an issue, a lingering issue, that when all these tests came out, um, they only they showed that maybe 10% of the population was immunized, 20% of the population was immunized. And as we see, for example, yesterday there were 864 deaths in the US from COVID, and that COVID uh, is becoming like a an endemic, like a uh, quite quite much much longer than what we thought that it's not going away as fast as we we hope 
And it, it could take a few years to go through the population because we are taking measures to slow it down. So the question is, how do people feel about public transportation in a world of COVID? And also all the, the fact that COVID is actually the opposite of an equal opportunity a killer as maybe the pandemic of 1918 was where the average age of the dead person was 28, which was kind of the average age of the population. Now, uh, the average age of the, the deaths is 79 with COVID in some countries, 70, uh, younger in the US, uh, but still quite old, right? And so there's all sorts of things about segmentation of transportation. Um, and, and the same group of people who have difficulty driving is the group of people who are dying of COVID. So now you're thinking, okay, what about special transportation, smaller share vehicles? And then the whole concept of autonomous vehicles, we, we used to think the only problem of a company like Too Simple or a company like Waymo or a company like Cruise was that they shouldn't uh, kill any pedestrians, that they shouldn't kill other people. But now COVID brings this unusual situation where the driver may kill the passenger, the passenger may kill the driver. Like nobody thought about that. Like we were always thinking the danger of, of getting into a, a public transportation or a taxi or a driven vehicle. We never thought that the danger was that the driver was going to kill you, right? Or that you were going to kill the driver. And, and with COVID unintentionally these things happen. And so, uh, but as Jessica said, you must have shared transportation because what, what happened in China, for example, everybody went back to their private cars and now it's even more uh, traffic jams than ever, more pollution than ever. That is not a solution. So it's not that I have the solution, but I've been asked and I've been thinking about this, a world of share, shared but safer vehicles, maybe with plastic dividers, and things that protect people from COVID until the pandemic is over. And also, fortunately, an urgency for autonomous driving because this urgency comes out of the fact that it's much less likely to get uh, for contagiousness to happen in a world of autonomy. So that's been a surprising blessing to the world of autonomy. We've also seen ec economics completely turned upside down and in April 2020, uh, e-commerce in the United States saw 49% growth. Chuck, Too Simple hauls all sorts of goods. You've done, I got to commend you again. You've done a whole strategy around partnerships with UPS, United States Postal Service, uh, McLean. And the interesting thing is, McLean, you're hauling the food for the fast food restaurants. UPS and the United States Postal Service, you're hauling e-commerce e goods for everything that we're buying. How have you been able to keep up with this incredible demand in e-commerce and the demand for fast, casual uh, food deliveries? Uh, yeah, great, great question. Um, and, and when the uh, COVID virus uh, struck and we were faced with the question of uh, what should we do as a company, um, we, did, we, we did a couple of things. We, we did an immediate uh, transition to work from home for all non-essential uh, folks or for all the engineers who didn't have to be uh, in the operations area. But because we were hauling food uh, and other, other essential goods, we decided we needed to keep our vehicles rolling because even though, you know, our movements are, are small relative to, you know, global UPS or uh, others, uh, they were on lanes that they depended on us to, 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 to move goods for. Uh, we also had a relationship uh, with uh, the Arizona Food Bank. And so uh, when this happened, we decided uh, to offer them for, for no charge uh, a freight movement. And uh, they took us up on it and we uh, began moving. Uh, it's basically a food balancing operation that they do. They, you have certain things in one state that are in shortage in another state and they move these these goods around the food food banks cooperate to get a balance uh, so we ended up moving a bunch of stuff from uh, arizona to texas um, on, a, on a daily basis and in the in the first 30 days we moved the weight equivalent of about uh, um, uh, about one and a half million uh, dinners um, so uh, so we were we were pretty proud of that, but 
um, uh, we have contractual relationships and we maintained those relationships. We, we did have to structure our teams in different ways. And that's really, that was the stressor. The question we, we asked ourselves was, how do, we, how do we defend ourselves against an outbreak in our own operational facility? We have a, a large facility with several hundred people in, in Arizona. Um, uh, so what we did is folks who did not have to touch the trucks and repair the trucks and do the things physically present, they worked from home. Uh, those who were the, the engineers and drivers uh, of the vehicles, we, we limited them to specific trucks and we teamed them together so that the same two people were always together in the same truck. And then we segregated our operation into two uh, shifts, basically, that never were in the building at the same time. So that if we had a breakout in one shift, uh, hopefully it was isolated to one team. Uh, in the worst case, it was isolated to one shift so that we didn't have to shut down the entire operation. So, and so far, uh, Knockwood, uh, we have not had a single case, uh, you know, that has been present in our facility. You know, we do the, the things that everyone does, temperature checks and masks and gloves and uh, a very high degree of sanitizing. Um, uh, but that allowed us to, to continue. And I was, I have to say, I was very proud of our team that they were willing to do that. When you move goods, is it, is it hub to hub? Is it half autonomous, full autonomous? How was that whole uh, process work? Yeah, um, so our commitment as a company is to go dock to dock. Um, so, so we operate uh, on highways, on surface streets, uh, into the facilities and to, uh, and eventually, uh, we aren't doing it now, eventually backing into the dock. We have demonstrated it, but we haven't implemented it uh, in, our, in our carrier runs yet. Um, uh, so it depends on the particular lane that we're operating on, whether we will go all the way to the facility or not. Uh, that largely depends on the frequency of the run. So for, for UPS, for example, we operate directly out of their facility and on surface streets. Um, for some of the other runs, uh, because they're a little more variable and we don't know where we may end up uh, run to run, we, we haven't automated it completely. But that, that is dependent on the run and that's the nature of this kind of tech that you have to map before you can operate autonomously. Um, uh, so, so we intend uh, as, a, as a production to be a, uh, a fully dock to dock capable solution um, uh, where uh, shippers or carriers uh, uh, don't have high frequency, we will have uh, terminals that they can bring their uh, their goods too, so that we can sort of amortize the cost of of the mapping operation uh, appropriately, so that we get an economic return uh, on a run. Um, those those are details that will be forthcoming. Uh, and there was a question that popped up that uh, does the yard uh, that we dock into require V to X? And the answer is no. Uh, our technology is all on the tractor. And, and, and Jessica, this is the last last COVID question. And in, in, in a post-COVID world, will we see any long-lasting impacts on autonomous vehicle regulation, uh, both in the UK and globally? Anything from your perspective that you might be seeing? Um, I think, um, as I said before, I, I don't think we're planning now uh, in terms of just keeping, you know, the lockdown situation, using that as our as our blueprint for what we want to structure for in the future. I think we are thinking we need to be resilient and be able to deal with uh, changing demand and have systems that actually enable that and encourage that. That's probably all I would say in that element. Yeah, that's good. And, and Martin, um, with changing demand, uh, data uh, was published today in the Wall Street Journal about uh, Europe 2021 travel season and how hotels are completely sold out in Greece and, and in Northern and Southern Italy for the summer for next year. What types of mobility services are you expecting uh, to see uh, during the summer of next year operating um, in these towns? Well, 
do you mean autonomous mobility services? We're, or we're not going to have autonomy, like shared mobility. You think that consumers because will, will exactly go back into shared? Autonomy is too soon. For, but what there has been a boom in Europe of uh, new mobility services, the same Lime and Bird and the scooters, the electric bikes, the, the electric motorcycle type of vehicles, the um, shared uh drive yourself uh, rent by the minute vehicles um i'm an investor also because of my uh other exits in other companies i have a uh, around 200 million dollars of funds that i invest and i invest some in transportation sort of let's say high risk investments new investments and i've been investing in for example a company called ample out of san francisco that uh, makes a robot that changes uh, batteries for fleets, so fleets can change uh, batteries and operate them, and so you don't need to buy such expensive batteries for vehicles that operate all day. There's, uh, there's scooters that also have battery uh, swapping systems, and scooters in general are, are uh, being used a lot, and also as a result of COVID, because everything that is individual transportation, um, where you're clearly safe from contact with others, uh, bicycles, scooters, motorcycles, electric motorcycles, uh, uh, is getting a big uh, push. So Europe is, uh, you go to cities like uh, Madrid, Berlin, Paris, um, you have a lot of choices, even more choices than in London, where I have seen less of these services, um, but there are choices in London too. So Europe has embraced new mobility services, but it's way behind with autonomous new mobility services. Well, that makes sense. And, and Jessica, and this is, uh, we'll go down uh, the, group, the group after this. As we look to the future and to wrap up this wonderful webinar, could you share with the audience what, in your opinion, the big update on autonomy will look like in the future? That's a, a big question, I guess. Um, I think uh, if we're looking ahead to what we know is in the pipeline, so for example, tomorrow, um, we understand Working Party 29 will be adopting the first UN regulation for a truly or self-identified uh, automated driving system, uh, the ALKS regulation, uh, which I think might become one, number 153, but uh, we'll, we'll find out when it actually eventually gets adopted. But it's likely that that means that going through the procedures already early next year, we might be seeing some systems which I think people would classify as level three uh, being uh, possibly rolled out. So we um, obviously will be awaiting to see what car companies and manufacturers might be putting that out. We know Audi has pulled out of the traffic jam assist, which was its original, it was its baby, if you will, um, initially. So it probably won't be Audi, but who knows? Um, that seems something that will probably happen. And I think that will bring to the forefront um, some really difficult legal questions. Of course, I would focus on the law, but basically it's the idea that, you know, when there's a person in the driving seat, which there will be for these systems, when they press the automated driving button, um, to what extent are they actually released from legal responsibility for all the things that might happen? Um, there is quite a bit of debate and there is not a uh, clear consensus about what, you know, what the expectation is the human everyone knows that you need to take back control if a system tries to hand you back control but what about evidence uh, system failure for example as the SAE talk about it or in the German legislation you know obvious circumstances um, to what extent will the human be responsible and I think there might be uh, some very difficult questions um, also with um, handoffs where maybe the human doesn't trust the system and makes a really bad judgment call and to what extent is that understandable? You didn't think the thing was going to stop. So the human might understandably and very in a human way, try and do something to make the situation better and make it worse. How are we going to react as a society to that? And also how will these uh, developing, uh, you know, these developers for the ADSs, to what extent will they actually take responsibility if there is a death? How will that uh, play out? There might be no wrongdoing at all. Incidents happen with no wrongdoing. Um, and how accepting will society be of just the, the statistics saying, well, overall, the system performs better than humans did, but it still means that, you know, this little child or if, especially if it's uh, a very uh, sort of uh, someone that suscitates uh, compassion, you know, in people like if it's a kid or 
a disabled person, it'll be difficult to sell that, I think, to people to say, hey, overall, the stats are great. I think people demand perfection, which is obviously impossible. And how are we going to bridge that and make sure it doesn't stop development? We don't want there to be just a knee jerk reaction saying, oh, we don't want these things. You know, they, uh, they kill people. And that could be a very natural reaction of people. And the law can help, but it's, I think, a very, um, it's more about public acceptance and seeing how that can evolve. So I see that as the big, big challenge. You're 100% right about, about public acceptance. I mean, this whole, from a passenger side, this technology is dead in the water without public acceptance if the public doesn't buy, buy into it. So uh, well said. And Chuck, in your opinion, from a commercial um, automated truck perspective, what will the future of autonomy look like? Um, well, I think uh, the, the, big, the big update will be next year when we start the first uh, driverless commercial operations uh, on on certain highways uh, in certain conditions, uh, with uh, you know the hope that this will this will be an education to the public that this is real and it's it's happening, uh, and it does it does create uh, a safer uh, transportation uh, system and and a more reliable one, uh, one that is. Uh, uh, you know, capable of operating effectively in things like pandemics. Um, uh, so we, we think this is close. Uh, we think we'll be the ones to do it, we hope. Um, uh, but we think it, it's coming uh, very quickly. Uh, so the big update is that uh, it, it won't be cars first, it will be trucks. Um, and the, the use case is clear for that. Uh, not so much for cars, especially, uh, you know, unfortunately, because I own a Tesla, the notion of a, of a fleet of owner, uh, owner owned uh, robo taxis that are that are Teslas uh, in, in a in a COVID world that becomes a little scary, who's gonna, who's gonna sanitize the cars between between rides, um, that that becomes a, a real question. So I think I think it's clear for trucks how this can work uh, and how it will be working. Um, and I will uh, comment on something uh, that uh, keyed on something that Jessica said uh, with the driver taking over and making a worse, making a situation uh, worse. We've actually uh, uh, now started having cases of this where a professional driver took control of the vehicle and actually uh, the, uh, the system was doing and and would have done better uh, than what the driver did. I mean, it wasn't you know not a case where things were in trouble, but when you analyze the data, you say, hey, it would have been better if they hadn't uh, if they hadn't touched it. Um, well, so I'd we, like to say I'd like to say something in Chuck's support that I'm a cyclist, right? And I I know many other people may not feel this way, but I would feel more comfortable if a truck passes me by that's driven by software, that it's driven by a person. Because I'm sure Chuck is working on a lot of software to detect cyclists and there won't be distractions, there won't be text messages, there won't be phone calls, there won't be drugs, there won't be alcohol, there won't be, like when you think about all the things that can go wrong with human drivers, of course things can go wrong with software drivers. But as I say that as a cyclist, I would feel more confident that a software driven truck is not going to run me over or deviate away from the road and run me over. The, and especially with cyclists, um, uh, I'm glad you mentioned that. There are specific rules that uh, trucks are supposed to follow in the presence of uh, pedestrians and cyclists because there's a, there's a tremendous uh, plow wind around uh, a truck, and if we if we pass by you too close, we can literally blow you over. So there are rules that uh, you know the regulators put in place for for passing uh, you know speeds and distances, and we actually have those built into our vehicles. So you can be assured that you're not going to have a vehicle go by you that is that is an immediate threat to you. This is an important point before we jump over to Martin to close out. I, I wanted to ask you about the, the virtual driver myth. 
where there's some companies that believe that they can take a passenger vehicle stack and put it in a truck as Martin has clearly articulated being a cyclist. That's not, it seems like that necessarily wouldn't be true. What are your thoughts on that, Chuck? Uh, yeah, we found uh, uh, that, that that really is not uh, feasible. You have to change everything. The perception system needs to be longer range and to be longer range, you have to use a different kind of sensor. So our sensor suite is camera forward, we say. The camera is a primary sensor, uh, which gives us far greater range uh, than you could ever achieve with LiDAR. Um, uh, LiDAR is, is important to us because it's a, it's a, it's a good secondary sensor, uh, but it's not our primary. And developing camera-based perception is it's radically different from LiDAR-based perception. You have to do many more things that most haven't done. Um, uh, beyond that, uh, once you understand the environment you're in, your predictions about vehicles around you are different because, because vehicles operate differently around trucks than they, than they do around cars. They make different choices, usually not great choices uh, around trucks. Um, and then trucks are dynamically very different. Um, uh, so your path planning your control, your prediction, your perception, everything changes. And the question is, do you try to build something universal that can accommodate all of that? I think probably it, it will never, it, it's not effective. And I, and I believe those who are in cars who are pivoting now are discovering that. And they're discovering that it, it is not easy at all to move to a truck. It's actually easier to move from a truck to a car uh, than it is to go the other way. And Martin, you, you have a background in dealing with complex situations and highly regulated into industry. So what would you say in your perspective the future of autonomy looks like? Well, I think that that uh, there's two sides to, of it. There's the engineering side, and there's a lot of engineering challenges, and autonomy has proven to be much harder than what people thought, and there were predictions in 2014 that by 2017, 2018, the world would see tremendous amount of autonomous vehicles, and we still haven't seen that, even though by that time, there, were a lot, there was a lot of testing, and there continues to be a lot of testing. So there's the engineering challenges. Um, but I, I'm optimistic. I've been involved in industries, like I built this company, Olia, that we sold last year for 1.4 billion, which was one of the first uh, wind and solar operators and solar panels, for example, as energy generators were considering 05, 06, that if the government didn't give you a lot of money and subsidy, it would never work. And a lot of people dismissed our technology. And when we said that we would see solar without subsidies, people were laughing at us. And, and now there's, of course, a lot of solar without subsidies, especially in the south of the United States or in the, in the south of Europe and so on. And, and I can give you many examples like that where people over, uh, are overconfident early on. Then there's a wave of dismissal of the technology. And then there's an embrace, embracing this technology. Uh, same happened with video on demand. Same happened with fiber optics. Like people thought, Fiber optics were amazing, then they thought they were useless. And now in a world of uh, COVID, without fiber optics, uh, with people would have thrown themselves out of the window, I think. I think actually telecom saved the sanity of a lot of people during the pandemic. So a lot of the things that were considered absurd uh, uh, are now uh, commonplace. And so I think we will see between 2020, 2025, significant deployment in the next five years of, of, of autonomy. But the, the question that uh, troubles me a little more, especially in Europe, is that while some nations like to embrace the future, and I think, for example, the UK and France, uh, the people of the UK and the people of France are more loving of the future. I think the people of Germany, for example, are, um, more hesitant and more concerned about the risks and very focused, as Jessica was saying, you get one uh, sad, tragic accident and you forget about the thousands uh, who die around the world uh, on a weekly basis, uh, uh, killed by, by regular vehicles. It's like, um, we saw that with COVID, like people uh, 
smoking kills more people than COVID. I mean, it's crazy, but it's true. And, and but we're very intolerant. Of course, every death is terrible, but if you're so, uh, if you don't tolerate death, why do you sell, why do governments charge a tax on cigarettes and make all this money? They should be not selling cigarettes, right? And so we're tolerant of death under circum certain circumstances. We're not tolerant of death or intolerant of death under other circumstances. And I think when people see the value um, of autonomy, of course, there'll be accidents, but they will come to the conclusion that Jessica mentioned, which is that people will say, well, this technology is safer on average. And yes, it still has accidents. And on top of that, it will, it will because we will have a world of autonomy interacting with a world of humans. Like if we, if we had to design, if Chuck had to design a highway where, where there's only his trucks, I think his life would be so much easier, right? And, uh, and so uh, my prediction is it's, it's happening. I know it's delayed, but it is happening. And we as operators, because we are, I, as an entrepreneur, I am an operator. I build just via tele, all the whatever, operators, prelude of operators of things. I'm eager to build an operator of autonomous vehicles. And I, I am ready to work with legislators and with technology makers to come up with uh, fleets of autonomous vehicles that will do this job. So. I am optimistic, but I know it's not going to be next month. And speaking of being optimistic, we can, the, everybody in this panel can agree that the future is autonomous. And I'd like to say thank you to each one, each one of our wonderful panelists for joining us on the MOVE panel. And uh, Cormac, over to you, sir. Great, thanks very much, Grace. And uh, as always, as I'm sure we're all familiar with having a little bit of trouble with the mute button there. But um, thank you all so much for joining us. Um, really exciting panel and uh, some great insights there. Um, but uh, yeah, just to wrap things up, um, big thank you to, uh, to Martin, Grace and Chuck and Jessica. Um, if you want to get in touch with any of them, uh, please feel free to reach out. Um, and this <clears throat> webinar will be available on demand online on, on the MOVE website and uh, should be email to all of you as well. Just to mention our next webinar as well, next week, um, midnight July 2nd, uh, 4 p.m. July 1st Pacific time and 8 a.m. Uh, July 2nd Japanese time. And um, yeah, just wrapping things up and uh, hope to see you all there. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.